I'm here to share a bit of a story and to introduce you to a couple of cool ideas. What we've got up here is uh, myself back in first year. Okay, I came to Guelph from Mississauga, and I came here to learn about you know, climate change and resource depletion, and a lot of those big issues of concern and how humans kind of fit into all of that. And at the time, I wasn't really sure how I fit into all of that. It was a bit indifferent to the topic. But one day, that changed, and it happened with a spoon. I was in my res room with someone who I really cared about, and to show that, I gave her a bowl of cereal. And she asked me for a spoon. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll be right back. I ran to my closet and I grabbed my box of 300 plastic spoons. I came right now with a big smile on my face and said, here you go. And I got a face of confusion back at me. And then she asked me the question, why the heck do you have 300 plastic spoons? And I was like, oh, that's a good question. Um, no one's ever challenged my spoon collection before. <laughs> and by asking that question, she opened up this, this tiny little space for a reflection to occur and for a connection to happen. And at that moment, it was kind of like Miley Cyrus came in with her wrecking ball and started breaking down my walls. <laughs> and I saw the connections between my plastic spoon lifestyle and the things I was learning about climate change and resource depletion. My actions were hurting the environment, hurting my community, and hurting me, right? And that was a bit of a realization. It was a heavy realization. At first, I felt shame, and I was embarrassed, and I wasn't really sure where to move from that, so I was a bit immobilized. And luckily for me, this friend ran to her room and came back and she offered me a metal spoon, a simple solution, right? So moving forward, I, I kind of fell in love with this idea of community. And uh, what community is, is this concept of people coming together and living in a place. If we expand to ecology, community is the interdependent relationships of multiple species within one area. So this idea of interdependence, it got me going, it got me excited. I was like, what else are my actions impacting? And I found this group called Transition Guelph, and they're part of a global initiative that's looking at and acknowledging our dependencies on fossil fuels and other unstable systems. And then they reskill communities so they become interdependent and resilient. And resilient. And they helped me expand my metal spoon experience. So they, they taught me where my food came from, the environment. They taught me the impact of my energy consumption, both globally and locally. And they helped me realize the consequences of lack of accountability or that lack of connection. And aside from that, they also empowered me and showed me that I could take on a role, a positive role of restructuring these systems. Right? We could challenge the existing fear-based narratives of society and then using positive visioning, we could create our own story that we could then move towards. And that was pretty cool, right? We're restructuring damaging dependencies into supportive interdependence. So there are a couple of narratives that I kind of grabbed onto. It was around food and community. And these two women up on your left, Tara Young and Vandana Shiva, really sparked that inspiration for me. Tara Young showed us how we could take agriculture and take it from something that was environmentally destructive and something that was environmentally regenerative. And then she also showed us how we could take the value chain and make it so that it was just her and the consumers. Take out all those middle men, all those middle women. And Vandana Shiva, amazing woman, she showed how diversity, both in seeds and culture, is so important, and how food sovereignty could probably save the world. <laughs> so that was really neat, and what they did much like Miley Cyrus may have done, um, they helped to expand and morph the space that I was in. I was finding that within this community, I was finding my, my, my niche. And that niche for me was community food. And for me, it, it was like this pillar that I could build up and grow and support and then use to leverage community, right? Because everybody hopefully eats. And food is intrinsic to our environment. It grows from the soil. And food is connected to our economy. It's connected to our culture. And it's connected to spirit. Right, so it has all those ties. So for me, I was like, this is it. Community-based food systems could change the world. And so within this niche, and in ecology, an organism within a niche could, maybe it could thrive, it could die off, or it could evolve and change and move on to another niche. But I was finding that I was thriving, and I was falling in love. And my mom taught me how to fall in love. <laughs> and I was falling in love with my community and with the environment in which I was growing food. And now, if you're ever lucky enough to meet this lovely lady on the 
far right, her name's Diane Longboat, a Mohawk Black or Turtle Island a woman of Six Nations. She might just tell you that unless you fall in love, you may never defend your land. And for me, that really stuck home. Because the more time I spent in the land, working with the soil and working with my community, I became more passionate about it. And I wanted to defend it, I wanted to take action. But I learned from Diane that it's not quite as easy as going out to you and being like, could you please fall in love so that all these problems are solved? <laughs> it's not quite that easy. <laughs> but reconnecting takes a bit of time and sacrifice. And I believe that within my story, I've, I've had a bit of time and I've had a bit of sacrifice. And with that, along with some of the community magic, I was blessed with a food baby. <laughs> and this food baby is called Many Rivers Permaculture. In Many Rivers Permaculture, what we do is we're trying to change the world through the way that we grow our food. Okay, and I say we because I recognize that I'm one naive young boy, but I also recognize that as a community, when we work together, what we can achieve is way greater than any individual. And I say we because this is the community narrative that we're trying to change. So it's going to take a little bit from everyone. So first, when you're changing narratives, it's good to kind of understand where you're beginning. So what are the existing challenges that we're working with right now? And I'm going to be focusing on food and agriculture when I talk about these challenges. Oh. <laughs> We've heard about this one. Um, monoculture is touted to be one of the biggest solutions for today's food problems. In my eyes, monoculture is kind of like a buffet that only serves mayonnaise. It's one piece, and that piece by itself isn't very useful. Right? In an ecosystem, when your ecology is diminished to just two or three species, maybe even two or three types of crops, you're leaving all these niches left open. When niches are left open, unbalance happens. In agriculture, they deal with that unbalance by implementing it with fossil fuel-based pesticides, fertilizers, and mechanization. Okay? All of those, just like my plastic spoons, contribute to climate change and resource depletion. Number two. When you remove trees from the land and you cultivate the soil, erosion happens. And erosion is kind of like diarrhea. You don't want to have it. Okay? So, uh, in Ontario alone, we have about 22 tons of soil per year. Sorry, 22 tons of soil per hectare per year leaving our soils. So it's a lot of diarrhea. And it's not so good. Here we go. So the next piece is that the environment has this amazing ability to be resilient on its own. If we denude the soils, if we take away the vegetation, it grows back another layer. And this is called natural succession. Natural succession is the pattern of vegetation that grows in an area over time. It's kind of like our bodies. We have different regions that grow different types of hair. No matter how often or how much you want to shave that off, it keeps growing back, right? So like in society where we're told to shape our hair in a certain way, Farmers are strongly encouraged to take the flows of their landscape and squish it within the confines of industrial agriculture. They're essentially fighting natural succession. That takes a lot of work and takes a lot of inputs. Fourth point is we've got to get this boy reconnected to the environment quick. Okay? That's the same thing with all of our community members. We've got to get them back into the environment, back with each other, back within themselves. So there. We kind of understand the base of the issues surrounding modern day agriculture. And that's a good point to kind of acknowledge, but then we need to take that and move forward into the positive visioning. So strip away all the fear, strip away all the barriers that may stop us from picturing the perfect world. And then we move forward, and how do we get to that point? So Many Rivers Permaculture right now is doing this really cool project called Community-Based Edible Forest Gardens. And we're looking at what an edible forest garden is and how to implement it. An edible forest garden, much like permaculture, mimics the patterns in nature to design. Okay, specifically, edible forest gardens looking at our forest ecosystems and taking some of those aspects and putting them into our agricultural systems. For example, we're looking at biodiversity, we're looking at natural succession, we're looking at multiple layers of perennial vegetation, and we're looking at diverse and abundant yields. Okay? And then it's kind of interesting because these aspects of a forest can help solve the issues within agriculture. So the first one, biodiversity. Our design is based off of it. Say we have an apple tree. That apple tree needs nutrients. So instead of bringing in synthetic fertilizers, we're going to put in plants like white clover and Siberian pea shrub and lupins to provide those nutrients, both from the atmosphere and from the soil. This tree needs a little bit of pest control every once in a while. So instead of using synthetic pesticides and wiping out a lot of stuff that we want to keep there, we're going to put in plants that create habitat, both above ground and below ground. And that helps to create the ecosystem. It makes the homes for the bugs and the fungi to come live in. And they help balance out 
pest populations and disease. And then we're looking at the innate ability of these systems to produce multiple yields. We're not just getting food from this, we're getting medicine, we're getting fuel, and we're getting fiber, and we're having fun and they're quite beautiful, so we get a little bit of aesthetics as well. Sorry, not there just yet. Um, the second point is the erosion problem that we had with. By working with fungi, by working with roots and ground covers and shrubs and herbs and trees that are all perennial, meaning that they stay there year after year, we're not having a problem from rain falling and causing erosion, and the wind is definitely not coming through there and lifting out our soil. Okay, so by having that, we're keeping the soil on the land, and then we're also um, regenerating the soil by all the additions of organic matter coming from those plants. And then we're looking at working with natural succession. Okay, so this land that we're walking on, there are stories on it. And you may hear from the original people of this land that a squirrel could cross from coast to coast without touching the ground once. That's because of all the trees that used to be on this land. So this land wants to be a forest. And in agriculture, we keep chopping it back and preventing it from happening. So what we're doing with this is that we're giving it a couple of trees and we're giving it a couple of shrubs and we're letting it grow. So we're working with that. And that helps reduce the amount of labor that we need to put in. Next is the community, and this is probably my favorite part. Um, we're collaborating with a bunch of community organizations to put these edible forest gardens in the ground and in the communities. And we have three gardens right now. Two of them are in Guelph. One's up at the Guelph Center for Urban Organic Farming here on campus, and then one's on Ignatius Organic Farm just north of the city here. The last one's in Mississauga at EcoSource Iceland Teaching Garden. And then we worked with those three because they provide an existing food hub already where they've created the space for um, community members to come in and reconnect with the land, understand who they are, and grow some of their own food. So they're already rewriting their narratives, which is kind of neat. And then we're also working with um, uh, academia. So I've been blessed to be able to do my master's program in Edible Forest Garden, and that's here at the Ontario Agricultural College, the University of Guelph. So we're looking at how Creating a diverse plant system on top changes and fosters a diverse microbial community in the soil, which is where everything kind of begins. And then we're also working with business, which is kind of neat. All those beautiful um, paintings that you've seen throughout the slideshow have been created by a local artist here named Garth Laidlaw. He's fantastic. And then another business partner is Impact. We're working with the, championship, the Sustainable Champion Leith Youth Leadership Program. And they're helping to disperse a lot of this and get other youth to come up and take these types of ideas of retelling stories into action. And so far in this year, we've had about greater than 400 people become engaged. And the cool thing is that we're engaging them in a bunch of different ways. We have talks like this, which are great, but we also have opportunities for people to come and get involved, to get their hands dirty and a little bit of that soil underneath the, underneath the nails. And we also have opportunities where people, oh, that was pretty quick. <laughs> We also have opportunities for people to come and learn about the whole process so that they could take it home and implement this in their home garden. And then we have people that come out and be volunteer worker bees, where they do every single thing that I do, whether it's the planning, the planting, the maintenance, the soil sampling, and all that good jazz, that they understand the process, that they're able to reconnect. So that's the beginning of this whole process and this project, and that's the beginning of how we are restructuring our story to tell a narrative that is a bit more beneficial to our communities, a bit more beneficial to our environment. A space for people to come to reconnect and to hopefully fall in love. Okay? And I wanted to end off by doing a little exercise with you folks. It's called the Edible Forest Garden Evolution. I'm gonna start by inviting you to raise your hand if you eat food. <laughs> nice. Um, raise your other hand if you breathe air and drink water. Nice, how's that feel? Um, and then we're going to Think of a plant, animal, um, fungi, bacteria, anything in the five kingdoms that you want to be in this edible forest garden right here. And just hold that into your head. And then, honey, if you love Mother Earth, won't you please, please smile and shake your fingers. Oh, yeah, your beautiful edible forest garden. One fist. This is your seed. This is your spore. This is your offspring. Okay? This is contained that experience that you just had. Okay? You can take this with you wherever you want to go. Right? And hold on to that. This is also solidarity. Solidarity for all the communities that are rewriting their narrative. Okay? And then I wanted to just end off by saying thank you, and if we could, instead of applauding, maybe try to express gratitude for ourselves and for other communities from our heart. Thank you. <laughs>